of Mark chapter 12. So if you would please stand with me and let's read our text. Mark 12, verse 38 through 44. Beginning in verse 38. And in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called to his disciples, he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. You may be seated. Let's pray. Oh God, we have sung of your goodness towards us. We've sung of your greatness as the God who saves and God, now we, we, we set our mind, we set our attention to your word. And Lord, I'm so aware that for, for many here, we come from busy weeks. We come from, from sickness. Many come and have suffered this week. Lord, there's many things that can distract us this morning. But you've given us your word. You've given us this word today. And so we pray you would give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see what your word has for us this morning. I pray you would use this imperfect and unqualified preacher to to deliver your word this morning. And may your spirit bring about conviction in our hearts as we encounter what you have for us in the gospel of Mark. In your name we pray, amen. Well, I think everyone can identify with this, but... Have you ever sat down and just people watched somewhere? Hopefully you're not doing it right now. <laughs> but if you're like me, you, you probably enjoy people watching. We do it at a coffee shop. We do it at a restaurant. But my favorite place, and in fact, I'm going to be there in about three hours, is at the airport to people watch. There's thousands of, well, not thousands at the Tucson airport, but <laughs> there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people coming in and out at the airport, all with different destinations, different backgrounds, different agendas. It's pretty fascinating to watch, isn't it? And you learn things about people as you observe them. You can pretty easily identify that, that businessman who's traveling for work from his suit and his briefcase. Or you can, you can recognize, you see a family with, with, with Mickey ears on, right? And you know they all just came back from Disneyland. Or you see an elderly person being pushed around in a wheelchair and you learn just a little bit about their personal struggles, don't you? And the point is, people watching can be a pretty valuable skill. You learn a lot about somebody even just by watching a few moments of their life. And I like to think I'm a skilled people watcher, but our text this morning shows us that Jesus is the ultimate people watcher. As chapter 12 wraps up, we are in the final moments of Jesus' public ministry, according to Mark's account, and we find Jesus not miraculously healing the sick, He's not casting out demons. He's not walking on water or feeding 5,000 people with a few fish and loaves of bread. No, Mark ends his account of Jesus' public ministry with him people watching in the temple. And as I thought about that, it almost feels anticlimactic, doesn't it? Especially considering all that's gone on in chapter 12 so far. We've seen over the last couple weeks, Jesus has been clashing with the religious leaders of the day. They've been throwing everything they have at him to try and trap him, and yet Jesus masterfully encounters or handles every single one of their encounters. And it all comes to a point in verse 35 to 37, we saw this two weeks ago, where Jesus makes this undeniable identity statement as he claims lordship as the true son of God. And all of that brings us to the final six verses 
of chapter 12. We're going to spend our time this morning. And this is where we find Jesus people watching in the temple. And he observes two different people, the scribes and an unnamed widow. And from these two examples, he lifts them up as two examples to his listeners, and we're going to see they stand in stark contrast to one another. But through them, Jesus teaches his listeners what the call of discipleship means in their lives. And ultimately, we will see from Scripture this morning that for us, the call of discipleship is a call of absolute surrender to God. So, let's begin by looking (coughs) at the first example from our text. As our text begins, Jesus is still teaching in the temple. Again, two weeks ago we saw he just established, beyond all doubt, he is the Son of God, the long-awaited Messiah that everyone has been waiting for. And now he draws our attention to the scribes. Look look down at, at verse 38 with me. It says, in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at the feasts. Jesus is kind of using strong language here, isn't he? he? He's been observing these scribes and he clearly has some issues with what these men are all about. And notice what he says. He says, Beware of the scribes. He begins by issuing a warning, and then he ultimately ends with what? He condemns them, right? And we're going to unpack a little bit more what, 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 what Jesus is condemning here, but it's important we know a little bit more about who these scribes were. And we've already been introduced to them throughout the book of Mark. If you remember up in uh, just a few verses earlier, it was a scribe that ran up to Jesus and agreed with his teaching, and Jesus says, you're not too far off from the kingdom of God. The scribes are part of that, that group of religious leaders that were clashing with Jesus in the first half of chapter 12. And they were, as their name implies, interpreters of the law. They, they, they were experts in the law. And as religious leaders, their job was to interpret, teach, and regulate the law. So kind of think first century lawyers here, right? And when it came to law, they were really, really smart. Don't turn there. But in Matthew 23, Jesus describes uh, the the scribes and the Pharisees. He says they sit on Moses' seat. In other words, they were the ones responsible for interpreting and delivering God's law to the people. And now Jesus, in our text, addresses the scribes, or at least a particular group of scribes, and he hands out this list of rather unflattering accusations about them, doesn't he? Look back down with me at verse 38. He starts by mentioning their clothing. And this might be odd to us, but, but the scribes would distinguish themselves from the common people by wearing these long flowing robes with, with a long white mantle that would run down to their feet. And it was meant to be a mark of distinction. If you walked into a crowd of people, you would know exactly who these men were. It was a way to communicate something about their status and their rank. And then if you look again, Jesus mentions they like greetings in the marketplace. When a scribe would walk down the street, People would be expected to rise, to stand, and greet them with titles like father and rabbi and master. Is that what the teachers probably do in the, in here in the congregation, right? You have your students rise and say, master, teach. Just kidding. <laughs> it was meant to show them honor and respect. And Jesus draws attention to the fact that they like this. And then he says, they have the best seats in the synagogue and places of honor at feasts. They would sit on this long bench in the synagogue that faced the congregation so the scribes would be in full view. And at feasts, they were given seats of honor so they could be distinguished from other guests. The better the seat, the higher the honor, and ultimately better the food, right? And so Jesus comments on all these things, and it begs the question, does Jesus just not like how these guys carry themselves here? Or is he getting at something deeper? And we can add some insight to this conversation if we go back to Matthew 23. Again, don't turn there. But if we listen to Matthew's account of our text, it gives us more detail here. In verse 1, it says, Then Jesus said to the crowd and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe what they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear 
and laid them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. And Matthew goes on to list the same unflattering accusations as Mark. But did you notice what Jesus said in Matthew? They preach, but they do not practice. So these men knew the scriptures. They were experts in the law, best seats in the house. They have religious authority. And yet Jesus says they will receive the greater condemnation. Why? Because they teach the law of God, and yet they do not practice what they preach. If you keep reading in Matthew 23, Jesus goes on to say, Woe to you, you hypocrites. And so Jesus is making a big deal out of all of this. But what is he drawing our attention to here? Think about all the examples we just looked at quickly. These men were all about themselves, weren't they? They loved themselves. They were prideful and showy and ostentatious. They, they loved all the honor and attention on themselves. And so let's, let's think about this for a minute. Do you remember the three commands from uh, uh, verse 30 a few weeks ago? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? What was the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. And then the third one, oh wait, there was not a third command to love yourself. Remember? But this is exactly what Jesus points out in the scribes. He's condemning them because they violate the greatest command that Jesus just taught to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so as we read this, this isn't ultimately about the color of their robes or the, the seats they sit in. This is about their heart, their unwillingness to surrender their lives to God. The scribes were clearly men of zeal, right? Right? But the zeal that was meant for the glory of God, the advancement of his kingdom, was turned into zeal for their own glory, the advancement of their own kingdoms. And get this, to make matters worse, if we look back down at verse 40, they violate the second greatest commandment. It says, they devour widows' homes. This most likely would have meant they, they took advantage of a widow's hospitality and their financial generosity, thus violating the second greatest commandment. And so we have to understand that Jesus is not simply correcting fashion choices here, church. He's getting at something deeper. If we consider where we're at in redemptive history for a moment, the long-awaited Messiah has finally come. The kingdom of God has, has arrived in the person of Christ. We saw this two weeks ago, and yet the religious leaders are more concerned with how Jesus might uproot their own status and authority and influence then they are surrendering their lives to him. And so they completely miss Jesus. He's standing right there in front of them, and they completely miss him. Listen to this quote from James Edwards. It says, The judgment of Jesus on those who practice religion for the purpose of self-advancement is blunt and stern. They will be severely punished. Jesus has immediately before defined the lifeblood of genuine religion to be the love of God and neighbor. There's an important connection between our text this morning and what we heard a few weeks ago uh, regarding the commandments in verse 30. Jesus puts forth these scribes as an example to his listeners, and he ultimately condemns them because they teach the law of God, and yet they do not surrender themselves, their heart, their affection, their love, their lives to him. It's exactly what we see in Matthew 23, and Edwards reminds us of the point here. The lifeblood of genuine religion, or we could change that to say the genuine discipleship, is first and foremost the love of God. And before we move on here to the next example, I want to, I want to point out one more thing in the text. As I've studied this week, I was constantly reminded, you know, as we think about chapter 12 here, I was constantly reminded that these men were the religious leaders of the day. And we don't have to think too hard to find examples in our own day and age of this, do we? Men who use their position, their religious authority for their own profit, to advance their own agenda, whose lives aren't surrendered to God and His Word, who preach but do not practice. And I was thinking this week how grateful I am that God has given this church two pastors 
who fear God and tremble at his word and seek a life of holiness. This is not the point here, but this text should remind us to pray for our pastors. Pray that they would keep their eyes on their Lord, that they would continue to surrender and submit their life to God. They did not ask me to say this, but this was on my heart this week as I prepared. Pray for your pastor's church. Okay. Now we move on to the second half of our text. If we look at verse 41, we find Jesus having moved to the temple. (coughs) (coughs) Jesus having moved to the temple treasury, and much like you or I, sitting in the airport watching the hectic scene unfold, Jesus sits down and begins to people watch in the treasury. Let's look at verse 41 together. Uh, Verse 41 and 42. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. You know, if we think about it, this is, a, this is a pretty staggering scene right here. You know, let's not forget, this is a real account of real people who are just going about their daily lives. And unbeknownst to them, in the corner of this treasury sits the creator God, who at that very moment is sustaining their lives. And he just quietly sits in the corner and observes these people. It's an incredible scene, church. Mark tells us that Jesus is people watching, or watching people put money into the offering boxes. And keep in mind, it's Passover. So, so this would have been a particularly busy place. There would have been plenty of people for Jesus to observe. And Mark notes in verse 41 that there were many rich people putting in large sums of money into the offering boxes. Now, there were 13 of these boxes called chauffeur chests, and they were shaped like a trumpet, so you could drop coins in, but you couldn't take coins out. And they were spread out in the treasury room. So you could see someone when they gave their money. And either with your eyes or with your ears, you could tell how much money was being given. And so this would have been quite a spectacle, not because, just because it was Passover and there were a lot of people, but you couldn't exactly hide what you were doing, right? They, they came for a purpose. They were, they were depositing money. And so you can almost imagine the crowd ooing and awing as all these rich people bring in large bags and clunk down a bag of money to be deposited in the box and the priest announces how much money was just deposited. I mean, I'm excited for the airport today, but this would have been a people watching dream right here. And over in the corner, Jesus is watching all of this unfold and he's unmoved, isn't he? He's not ooing and awing at these massive gifts that come pouring into the temple. In fact, something else demands his attention, doesn't it? In verse 42, a new person enters the temple treasury, and Jesus fixates his his full attention on this, this poor widow. We don't even know her name, who enters the room. We know nothing about her except for what we read in verse 42, but Jesus gives her his full attention. Keep in mind, she has no idea Jesus is watching her from a few feet away. I doubt anyone paid attention to her. They were watching the suitcases of money that were coming pouring in to the offering box. But Jesus watches and watches. And he observes as this poor widow makes her way to the offering box. And she doesn't have a bag full of money. She doesn't have anything to clunk down on the table, she draws no attention to herself. Rather, she reaches out her hand and drops two small copper coins into the receptacle. That's it. Mere change, right? I mean, an utterly insignificant amount of money compared to what these rich people were given. If anyone was paying attention to this widow, you know what they would have said? They probably would have laughed at her petty offering. And yet this this small act of this poor widow seems to move Jesus. 
He's unmoved by these rich donations that come pouring in. But these two copper coins that probably even barely made a noise seem to have moved Jesus. So much so that what does he do? He calls his disciples over and draws their attention to the example of the poor widow. Let's look next at verse 43 and 44. It said, And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. And let's stop there. Jesus starts out by saying, truly I say to you, which tells us this is not, he's not making a trivial observation here. He's about to teach important truth to the disciples. And then he goes on to make the statement that, that, that the widow has put in more than everyone else. And you can imagine the confusion on the disciples' faces here. What, what, what does he mean she contributed more? Are we watching? We're talking about the two copper coin widow, right? Are we talking about the same person here? What she gave was nothing compared to everyone else. And again, I'll call on James Edwards to help us here. He says, in purely financial terms, the value of her offering is negligible and unworthy of compare to the sums of wealthy donations. But in the divine exchange rate, things look differently. That which made no difference in the book of the temple is immortalized in the book of life. Jesus can't be talking about the financial merit of her contribution here, right? Obviously, her two little coins are worthless compared to everyone else. Yet, as Edwards tells us, for Jesus, the divine exchange rate is different. Somehow, he makes this claim that she's contributed far more than everyone else. And again, consider the moment here. This widow has no idea her actions will be written down for us to read so many years later. She had no idea Jesus would lift her up as an example to the disciples. But for Jesus, the actions of this poor widow represent something. He condemns the example of the scribes, but he praises the example of the widows. And so let's let Scripture help us understand Scripture here and read verse 44. He says, for, all, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put everything she had, all she had, to live on. Jesus gives the disciples a clue to what he's saying right here. Notice he puts the value not on the financial merit of the gift, but on the cost to the giver. All... All of these people were giving out of their abundance, money they could spare, money that wouldn't be missed. But this widow gives out of what? She gives out of her poverty. And Jesus says she gives all she had. And if we think about it, there's significance that there were two coins, isn't there? How easily could she have kept one coin to pay for food, to pay for lodging, to pay for clothes, or just to save for a rainy day? But she doesn't, right? She gives it all to the offering box. Verse 44 helps us understand what Jesus means when he makes this claim in verse 43. And so what is the point of all this? Why why, why does Jesus summon his disciples over to look at the example of the widow? Well, the scribes were condemned for their failure to obey the command in verse 30. But this widow is a humble example of living out the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. These two insignificant copper coins represent something. They represent total commitment to God. She did not give what she could spare. She did not give that that wouldn't be missed like the other people in the temple. She gave all she had, church. Her small offering represented giving her whole life to God in absolute and total surrender of herself. And this is what Jesus wants the disciples to see. He draws their attention away from the financial value of the gift to show them the divine value of surrendering her life to God. And church... The implications of this text 
are immense and immediate for us today. If the call of our discipleship is a call of absolute surrender to God, then it means something in our lives, doesn't it? Listen, it's true that we cannot surrender ourselves to God apart from our money. But the point of this text is not that God wants your money. The point of the text is that God wants your whole heart. You can show up to church every week and yet your life not be surrendered to God. You can drop a tithe check in the church every single week and yet your life not be surrendered to God. Your life can look a certain way on the outside, and yet your heart, your life, not be surrendered to God. And if you don't believe me, see scribes in verse 38. Jesus summons the disciples to look at this widow, and he draws their attention to the reality that she gave all she had to God. Everything she had surrendered to God. And ultimately, it was a reflection of the widow's heart. A heart surrendered to God that held nothing back. And church, this is the call of our discipleship today. The total and absolute surrender of our lives. And I hope we see this, not from me, but from what scripture says, that the demand is on our entire life. And if that's true... And we don't have time to talk about all the ways we do that today. But as we consider what this means, what it means for us to surrender our life, I want to move on to to three categories that came to mind this week that I think can be the most difficult for us. And it's easy to begin with the category we see in our text, and that's our money. And I am well aware that this is a personal area of our life that we don't like people to know the details of how we view and use our money. But scripture's rich, isn't it, on how we're called to surrender our wealth to God. I I once heard somebody who's a faithful giver in this this church uh, confessing community group that, that every time money comes into their life through a bonus at work or a raise or maybe just a gift, their natural instinct is to start thinking about how much more money they can save how much more quickly they can pay off their debt, what what, what kind of car payment they can afford now, how they can increase their lifestyle in some way, rather than this, I can tithe more. I can give more money to the gospel mission in my city or in the gospel mission across the world. I can allocate more dollars to the hospitality of the unbelievers in my life. And listen, I don't share that. I share that because when I heard that, that hit me like a ton of bricks with conviction. Because I was reminded that our money speaks. And it tells us where our heart is, doesn't it? And listen, there's nothing wrong with buying a nicer car or upgrading your lifestyle in some way. But a life of absolute surrender to God means we think differently about our money that God gives us, doesn't it? And we heard this this morning. We have a unique opportunity coming up to walk in this. Every April, what do we do? We do an April sacrificial giving. And in God's sovereignty, this wasn't my doing, this text is a month before that offering. What does it look like for your family to surrender your money to God during that offering? I can't tell you what that means. My wife and I are going to set some time aside this week to consider that question. And I encourage you to do the same thing in light of this widow's example. The second thing is this. Our own personal convenience. You know, Pastor Tim talked about this in our Equip series. It's not convenient to put your reputation on the line to put your name on the line when you take a risk at work and you share the gospel with that unbeliever. It's not convenient to stop and slow down in the middle of a very busy day and share Jesus with someone who God has sovereignly brought into your life. It's not convenient 
to risk popularity at work or risk popularity at school by standing on God's word in the face of cultural norms. Listen, it's not convenient sometimes to lay down our life and bear one another's burdens, but we're called to surrender our life, and that includes our personal convenience, doesn't it? And this last category is perhaps the biggest one for most of us, and I want to give this more attention because it's been on my heart this week. And that's our time. I've recently tried to stop saying this, but normally when people ask me how I'm doing or, hey, how's life? My response is typically something like this. You've probably heard me say this. Oh, my business is busy. Family's busy. Church life is busy. We got me, it's all busy. Right? Who said that before? Nothing wrong with that. But I've tried to stop saying that because I caught on to something. We're all busy, right? Work, family, meetings, homework, school, community group, kids. I mean, we can spend the next 10 minutes just talking about how we're all busy, church. We have to understand something. There is an all-out bidding war on our time. And here's the reality. Whatever bid we place the most value on, we will surrender our time to, won't we? Let me just give us a couple categories to think about here that are crucial to our discipleship. Do you find yourself neglecting the spiritual disciplines of meditating on God's word, prayer, evangelism, fellowship, because you're too busy with fill in the blank. Listen, I get, we have demands on our life. God has called us to many things, but how easily can we insert something there, right? Now you guys have heard this. Martin Luther said one time, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours of my day in prayer. Listen, we're all busy. We weren't the central figure of the Reformation. (laughs) And I will confess, I've never spent the first three hours of my day in prayer. But Martin Luther, his time reflected where his heart was. And his heart was surrendered to God. What about this? Do you find yourself neglecting the gathering of God's people because you're too busy with fill in the blank? Work's crazy and too tired. Kids have to make sure their, their schedule doesn't get interrupted. And listen, the gathering of God's people is not limited to what we're doing right here. Do you neglect the grace of community group with other believers in your life? Do you neglect a a series like Equipped that is meant to prepare us and equip us to bring the gospel message to the lost, the very work God has saved us for? Do you neglect the gathering of God's people because you're too busy? Let me remind you of the widow's example once more. This is not about an attendance record, and I hope you don't hear that. This is about our hearts, church. But do not forget what the author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. If you find yourself neglecting the spiritual disciplines or neglecting the gathering of God's people because you're too busy, let me submit this to you, and I've been considering this as well. We are surrendering our time to something other than God. whether it's our money, our convenience, 
our time, or fill in the blank with whatever coming into your mind right now, these things speak and they tell us where our heart is. There's plenty of other categories we could have talked about, but the question we must all ask ourselves this morning is this. Where is God calling you to surrender your life this morning? What area of your life must you repent of surrendering to someone or something else and turn and surrender that very thing to God? And beginning with me, no one in this room is perfect. So let us consider that question this week. The point of all of this is that God does not demand aspects of our life. God demands our entire life. And let me remind you, I'm not talking about salvation here. We know scripture is clear that we cannot earn our salvation by the giving or the surrendering of something in ourselves. Our surrender is only possible because of Christ. I'm talking about our discipleship, church. What it means for you and I to wake up every day and be a follower of Christ. Not according to me, according to God's word. Think back to what we learned in Mark chapter 8. Jesus taught this, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. If this all sounds kind of radical to you, the gospel brings radical transformation in our life, doesn't it? The call of our discipleship is a call of absolute surrender, total surrender of our whole life. Not just the parts that are convenient, not just the parts that, that we won't miss, but an absolute surrender of our life. This is what this poor widow modeled for us in that temple on that day. And listen, I'm aware that there might be some here this morning whose life is entirely submitted to the world. And you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if that is you this morning, hear this. We sang about this this morning. Jesus invites you to come and repent and turn from your sin and surrender your life to him today. He doesn't require you to clean up your act. He doesn't require you to, 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 to get your affairs in order first. No, he welcomes you with arms full of mercy and forgiveness. He beckons you with hands scarred from the nails that hung him on the cross where he bore your sin upon himself so that you could live for him. And so if that is you this morning, come and receive prayer and talk with someone after the service about what it means to surrender your life to Christ. But listen, for all of us here, there's many things we can learn from the example of this widow. But she's not the only model of this. In fact, she's not even the primary one we should look to to see this example. Let me remind you of something. It's still Tuesday of Holy Week, and Jesus is headed to the cross. Right. Jesus just put forth this widow as a model for the disciples to see of giving her life to God. And what is Jesus about to do? The disciples don't know it yet, but he is headed to Calvary. Jesus is on his way to the cross where he will literally give up his life. And hear this, not as a model, not as an example of what it means to be good, he gives up his life as a substitution, as an atonement as a propitiation, as a sacrifice once and for all for every sin we would commit before God. 
Jesus gives up his life in a substitutionary death. He stood in our place. He hung in our place. He was condemned in our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us as he laid down his very life so that we could be reconciled to God, church. And praise God that he did not hold anything back. He had the power to come down from that cross. But Jesus didn't go halfway, did he? He didn't just give what was convenient for him. He gave his entire life for you and I. If you've if you've turned me tuned me out and you hear nothing else, hear this. Christ surrendered his life on the cross so that we might surrender our lives to him. Let that be your motivation, church. Let that be the reason why each and every day we wake up and we, 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 we live the day that the Lord has put ahead of us and surrender, not aspects of our life, not parts of our life that are convenient, but our entire life to God. The call of our discipleship is a call of absolute surrender to God. I can ask the worship team to come up. I want to end with these words from our friend John Wesley. Should be on the on the screen. He says this I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will, rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. Church, let us, with great joy, wholly surrender our lives as individuals, and as a body, as God's church, to Jesus. Because Jesus wholly surrendered himself for us. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we thank you and we praise your name for all that you have done. God, for sur- Jesus, for surrendering your life for us. Not because we had earned it, not because we had done something to, to merit it, but only because of your love and your great, glorious plan of salvation. You surrendered your life on the cross for us. So let us leave here with that reminder. Yes, there are things that we go and we we do as we live out, as we surrender our lives. But God, keep us close to the truth that we do these things because you surrendered your life for us and you are worthy. So give us the grace, we pray. In your saving name we pray, amen.